thank you very much for coming and allowing me to share with you some of my recent research on the intergener intergenerational elasticity of earnings. This was done with some both current and former PhD students of mine. Just in terms of what we do in this particular paper is we look into trying to understand why high-income parents have high-income children. In the United Kingdom, on average, parents who have income that's 1% above average have children whose earnings are about 0.3% above average. So sometimes we refer to that as the intergenerational elasticity of earnings, and that is approximately 0.3. The question is why? There have been numerous papers written trying to understand the different pathways by which high-income parents have high-income children. The contribution of this paper that I'll present to you today is that we're going to try to bring together all these different pathways in one systematic framework. Now, just in terms of previous research, it's shown that children of high-income families attain more years of schooling, they have higher cognitive skills, they receive more investments, and by that we mean both parental time and also school quality, and they face different family environments. They have more highly educated parents, they have fewer siblings, and so that means that each child can potentially get more parental time. So just in terms of thinking about this schematically, we want to think about a framework where parents' income is going to impact all the things within this box. It's going to be at least associated with family background characteristics, also with investments, cognition, which we'll measure at age 16, and years of schooling. We'll also allow all these different channels to impact child's earnings. And what we'll do in this paper is we'll decompose the relative importance of all these different objects. And furthermore, we'll try to think a little bit about how these different pathways are related. So for example, higher parental investments could impact cognition, which could in turn impact schooling and thus uh, children's earnings, for example. Now, just in terms of the data that we're using in this paper, we're using a data set called the National Child Development Study. If you've ever seen the UP series, Think of this as the UP series in statistics. It is the entire census of everyone born in one week in Britain in 1958. Parents of these children were interviewed when the children were first born, age 7, 11, and 16. And then these children at older ages wound up being interviewed themselves. So what this means is that we have fabulous data on parental income, the individual's earnings over their entire life cycle, and furthermore, we have information on pot potential drivers of the persistence of earnings over the life cycle, drivers of these individual earnings. To the best of our knowledge, this is the only data set in all the world that has both measures of, for example, parental investments early in life, as well as earnings late in life. With these data, we'll be able to help quantify all these different pathways that I talked about before. The fact that children from high-income families grow up in family environments with more educated parents and fewer siblings. They receive more time investments. And by time investments, we have a very, very large number of different measures. So for example, parents were asked about whether or not they read to their child and how frequently the outings with their children, their interest in the children's education. Furthermore, we also have information from the teachers of these children about whether or not the parents were interested in the child's education. We also have information about the school that the child went to and lots of characteristics of these schools. So I just want to very briefly show you a little bit in terms of some of these measures of parental investments that we're using in this paper. What we've done here in this table is we've split everyone up in our data by parental income tertiary. 
this just shows a very small sample of all the different measures that we have. So for example, teachers were asked, are the parents very interested in the education of the child? They were asked that uh, when the child was age 11, 7, 16. And what you can see here is that at all ages, children born to high income parents um, were reported to be more interested in their child. So for example, 31% of all parents at the bottom of the income distribution, um, the teacher of that child said the parent was very interested in the child's education. Contrast that with those born to parents in the top of the income distribution, 37% of the time the teacher reported that the parent was very interested. Likewise, we have lots of measures of school investments. For example, children born to high income parents, they tend to uh, go to schools with fewer students per class, for example. We also have lots of other measures of, for example, cognitive skills me measured at different ages. We're going to focus in on cognitive skills at age 16. Here we have both standardized reading and math test scores. Furthermore, we also have teacher assessed ability. Again, children born to parents at the top of the income distribution, they score about a 10th of a standard deviation better across all different sorts of uh, tests. And finally, they obtain more years of schooling. Now, we almost have an embarrassment of riches in terms of all these different measures. What we want to do is we want to turn this very large number of measures into uh, deeper co concepts, for example, time investments. So we have lots of different measures that we think are associated with time investment, but they're noisy measures. What we do is we build upon uh, the work of a recent Nobel Prize winner, Jim Heckman, and we devise latent variable frameworks by which all these different measures are noisy measures of a deeper underlying concept. So for example, parental interest is a measure of uh, parental time investments. Student teacher ratios are a noisy measure, for example, of school investments. Furthermore, what we can do in this paper is we can think about indirect effects. Now, years of schooling, and by that, I mean uh, whether or not, for example, you go on to college, whether or not you uh, complete secondary school, that's potentially a function of whether or not you have high cognition at age 16, right? Going to college is going to be easier if you are better prepared for college. So we'll think about that as a mediating factor, as it's often referred to. So parents with high income, they have children with higher cognition and that it, and also uh, more years of schooling, but it's not instantly obvious whether it's the higher cognition or just the higher income um, of these people that leads their children to attain more years of schooling. We'll try to uh, work all that out. Furthermore, the higher cognition of children born to high income parents, that might be a function, for example, of greater investments, and these investments might be a function of uh, family background, as well as, for example, uh, the income of the parents. So let me just jump straight into the final results that we have in this paper. The first thing that I want to show you is for this initial analysis, using the measures that we have, the family background measures, the investment measures, age 16 and cognition combined, they can explain a little over half of the intergenerational elasticity of earnings. The remainder at some level is a measure of our ignorance, you could think of it as being. It may represent, for example, uh, personal connections of the parent in terms of helping that kid get that good first job. It could represent, for example, the correlation of preferences for hard work across generations. This framework is silent in terms of those relative uh, reasons. But what we can say is that the key drivers of 
uh, the intergenerational elasticity of earnings, this high persistence of earnings cross generations, that it's a result, at least in part, due to uh, higher years of schooling and higher cognition of these children born to high income parents. Now, and the second level of mediation, again, what we can do is we can think about the extent to which years of schooling is a function of other objects such as age 16 cognition. Here, what we can see is that the years of schooling of children uh, born to high income parents, that, that high level of schooling, it can be actually more than fully explained by the high levels of cognition at age 16 of these children. So in other words, you can really think of it as in terms of what we can explain of the intergenerational elasticity of earnings, all of it is really explainable by things that have happened by age 16. And the next step, we can decompose and, and think about what is the driver of cognition. Here, what we can see in this third level of mediation, where we allow cognition to be a function of uh, investments, as well as family background variables, what we can see is that that cognition is almost fully explainable by the higher levels of investments received by these children. So what this is telling us is that we, we don't need to think about uh, genetics or, or anything like that. Children uh, of high income parents, they have high income themselves. And that is largely due to the fact that they receive more time investments, better school quality than children born to low education parents. And the final step, we allow these investments to be a function of these other family background characteristics. For example, number of children within the household, that it can explain part of it. However, what you can see is that even once we account for, for example, number of siblings, parental education, things like that, investments are still very important. By th that, uh, this is getting at the idea that high income parents invest more in their children, regardless of, for example, the number of children within the household or uh, parental education. So just in terms of summing up, I've shown you results for men. We have somewhat similar results for women. And what we can say is that years of schooling and cognition explain the largest shares of the intergenerational elasticity of earnings, the persistence of income across generations. However, the effect of years of schooling it is entirely mediated by the fact that children born to high income parents have higher levels of cognition and cognition is largely mediated through the higher levels of investments received by these children of high income parents. Finally, differences in investments between rich and poor families really do matter for the intergenerational elasticity of earnings and not all of them can be explained by family background. Thank you very much.